Documents have a terrible reputation in our society. They are dull, dusty, left on a shelf, or just stuck in a drawer. According to Google, this is what documents is all about. Piles of paper and stacks of files carried around by faceless bureaucrats. Documents have come to symbolize inefficiency and meaningless activities. The term paperwork often serves as an antidote to real work, productivity and creativity. Yet this widespread negative view of documents amounts to a striking paradox. Because our modern society is built upon documents and paperwork. It cannot function without sophisticated professional systems for writing, circulating and storing documents within both the state and private corporations. And neither can we as individuals live our lives as usual without our personal documents. Just think of your passport, your health record, your mortgage contracts, and university diploma or other key documents in your own life. These are all documents that define who you are, where you may live, where you are allowed to travel and what work you are able to do. These documents do something important. They document that you are who you say you are. And they do this by linking you to the key institutions of our society. The passport links you to the nation state, the health record to the national health registry. The mortgage contract links you to banks and legal courts and the diploma to a university and to employers. And these are just a few examples of how we all, through documents, are linked to systems and infrastructures that together constitute a nation, a government and an economic system. These links often remain invisible and we don't think much about them until they are cut and their importance become acutely visible. Just think of the term paperless immigrant. Without your key documents, you may not be able to prove how your physical person is linked to a nationality, to a property or to a set of professional skills. And you may thus be denied access to a country and to a healthcare, to a house or to a job. So we may thus define document in the following way. It must have been preserved or recorded towards the ends of representing or reconstituting or of proving a physical or intellectual phenomenon. This classical definition of documents is from 1951 by one of the pioneers of document studies, the French librarian Suzanne Brier. And you should note the verbs in yellow here. A document does something. We have a material thing, the document, that is recorded by someone through a specific process and that serves to link the text to a real world phenomenon. We should therefore think of documents not as just an isolated text, but also always as a part of larger processes and contexts. So as students and researchers, we should therefore also analyze documents in this multidimensional way and keep our eyes open for how documents may affect the specific cases and actors that we study. This means that document analysis does not only involve textual analysis or discourse analysis, it should also consider the active role of documents, documents in practice. And this is what Kristin Astal suggests to call practice-oriented document analysis. The attention to documents in practice, in effect, breaks down the division between text on the one hand and reality on the other, because it makes documents an integrated part of the very reality that we are studying. And this makes practice-oriented document analysis very useful for social scientists. Practice-oriented document analysis allows us to combine methods from various disciplines and fields within the humanities and social sciences, and social sciences such as interviews, focus groups, surveys and observation and other methods that you learn about in this course, with rhetoric, archival studies, historical source criticism and digital methods and other methods from the humanities. This provides you with a well-equipped toolbox from which you may select and combine methods that suits your specific research question. So how to do this in practice? How may you integrate document analysis in your master's project? 
In the next segment, I will talk about how you may collect and organize your data and then suggest ways to analyze this material. And finally, highlight some important points related to research ethics.